first of all, I want to introduce you to workforce skills as not just an organisational issue, but a wider economic and political issue as well. Everybody wants a piece of organisations and their training budget. We're going to consider the changing nature of skills in the contemporary economy, and in doing that, we are going to build on the knowledge that you, that you gained in advanced organisational behaviour last term, in particular the idea of emotional and aesthetic skills. We're going to look at the difference between training and development. There is a difference and it matters, in HR terms anyway, even if not in the big wider scheme of things. And we're going to consider how human resource development is planned and, yep, you've guessed it, we've got another cycle to go through. We're also going to look at um, e-learning and internships as well. So, the skills agenda. What do we mean when we say the skills agenda? Well, as this quote uh, states from the European Commission, published in 2010, lifelong learning programme, education and training opportunities for all, improving people's skills is a real win-win for all. The economy, for society, for employers, and of course, of course, for individuals themselves. In every single EU country, unemployment rates systematically vary with qualification levels. The employment rate for those with high skill levels across the EU as a whole is approximately 85%. Medium skill levels, 70%. And for low skill levels, it stands at 50%. So we can see here that it, this is an EU document that in the European Union and other parts of the world as well, it's not just about businesses training their workers to do the jobs they require them to do, but that educating our workforce is seen as an economic and social good. If you are more highly qualified, if you have higher skills, you're more likely to have a job. So here we're seeing uh, an assumption that having a job is a good thing. You might change your mind on that when you go out to work. I'm going to show you a little video, which is from the National Employers Skills Survey. These are the latest statistics on skill shortages and gaps. The video will explain what a skill shortage and a skills gap is. Um, but just briefly to say, at the moment, we are clawing our way out of a recession uh, in, the, in Europe and America, at least. And it's we're seeing situations of high unemployment. Uh, up to 25% of young people in Spain are unemployed, for example. That's not to say that employers can pick and choose from this massive group pool of unemployed people, because only some people have the skills that businesses require. And that's what this short video is going to be about. <coughs> The UK Commission's Employer Skills Survey is one of the largest surveys of its kind in the world, with over 87,500 businesses interviewed. It is the key source of information on business demand for and investment in skills. For the first time, the survey covers the whole of the United Kingdom, which allows comparisons between the home nations and between the United Kingdom and other countries. This series of webisodes explores key messages which have emerged from the survey. This episode will look at skill shortages and skills gaps why they are important, and how they impact upon business productivity. We refer to two key measures in this episode. Hard to fill vacancies are job vacancies that businesses said were difficult to fill, where businesses told us that it was because of problems with their applicants' skills, qualifications, or work experience, we refer to these vacancies as skills shortages. Skills gaps occur when a current employee in an organization is not fully proficient in their role. How common is it for businesses to experience these problems? 16% of all UK job vacancies at the time of the survey were difficult to fill for skill-related reasons, equating to over 100,000 skill shortages. While only a minority of employers experienced a skill shortage, they tend to be concentrated in specific industries and occupations. Skill shortages are particularly prevalent amongst the Skilled Trades Occupational Group. One in every three vacancies for skilled tradespeople, such as electricians, plumbers or chefs, are caused by skill shortages, which is double the average figure for the entire economy. 
By industry, there were nearly 27,000 skill shortages reported in the business services sector, including accountancy firms, solicitors and marketing companies. But this reflects less than one in five of all vacancies in the sector. Higher concentrations of skill shortages and therefore perhaps more pronounced difficulties for business are found in agriculture, manufacturing and the social and personal service sector, which includes museums, sports clubs and hairdressers. So, skill shortages reflect difficulties businesses have recruiting staff. We turn now to what happens inside the business. Skills gaps refer to existing members of staff who are not fully proficient in their role. And here there is a similar story of concentration. Overall, across the economy, 5% of employees are reported as having a skills gap, equating to around 1.5 million workers. But we can see that gaps are more prevalent in specific occupations and industries. Sales and customer service occupations, such as sales assistants and call centre agents, and elementary occupations, such as bar staff, security guards and cleaners, see a concentration of skills gaps. Almost 600,000 people, or 8%, in these two occupational groups are not fully proficient. By industry, businesses in hotels and restaurants, and wholesale and retail sectors, have the highest proportions of staff with skills gaps. Turning to the localities where skills gaps are felt, there is also a large variation by geography. Across the United Kingdom, 13% of businesses said that at least one member of staff had a skills gap. But this hides a large range. 25% of businesses in North East Lincolnshire and 23% of businesses in Plymouth had a skills gap. On the other hand, two London boroughs, Merton and Bexley, had the fewest businesses reporting gaps. Now, we know about skills deficiencies in particular pockets of the economy, but what is the business impact? 95% of businesses with a skills shortage said that this issue was having an impact on their business. The most common impacts were an increase in the workload of other staff, difficulties in meeting customer service requirements, and losing business to other competitors or delays in the development of new products and services. Skills missing within the current workforce also had significant effects. 61% of businesses with skills gaps felt that their business performance had been affected. We can see that for businesses that find themselves with skills deficiencies, the impact of these issues can prevent them from competing and thriving. If you want to address a skills deficiency or introduce improvements to products or services that require new skills, what can you do? Commissioners at the UK Commission for Employment and Skills have launched funds to invest in business-defined solutions to skills needs. The Growth and Innovation Fund and the Employer Investment Fund have provided matched funding to target specific sectors where we know that there are skills deficiencies. Also, Investors in People is a tool for businesses to achieve better results through their people. To view the other webisodes in this series, to explore the survey further, or to find out more about the UK Commission's work, please visit our website or follow us on Twitter. Uh, I was surprised that hospitality, retail and service sector jobs are the areas where most skills gaps occur. Now, when I found this video, I thought, oh, that's bound to be skilled trades, computing, engineering, something like that, I don't know, space programming or whatever. But hospitality, retail and service sector have non-proficient staff. So that basically means that um, organisations or employers in those sectors feel their, their workforce aren't fully trained for the jobs that they do. And that took me by surprise because, I don't know, maybe I'm being biased, having been bar staff and waitress in various places in my life doesn't require an awful lot of training, in my humble opinion. Um, but maybe that's, maybe that's changing. So what I'd like you to do for a couple of minutes is sit with the person next to you and make a list of some of the skills that you think are needed to do these jobs. So what, what is it that these employers are expecting people to do that they can't? Okay, just make a, a literally few minutes, four or five minutes. You don't need to hand them in or anything.
Right, so we've got quite a few ideas here. Um, somebody's talking earlier about... Um, and <laughs> he was struggling to find the right words as opposed to, uh, you know, major skills, proper skills. It's really hard to define what a skill is. Do you remember last week we looked at competence? Um, and some of these fall more firmly into a competence because, sure, product knowledge, for example, and giving good customer service is a competence rather than a skill. But can they be trained? This idea of tacit knowledge, if I asked you to explain, who, or who here can, can ride a bike? Who can ride a bicycle? A few of you. A few of you can't ride a bike, really. Really, yeah. I can ride a bike. I haven't done for a while. If I, if I asked you to explain to me how to ride a bike, Menglin knows, I've just used this example with him in personal tutor. <laughs> if I asked you, how do you ride a bike? And you told me, well, you have to sit on the saddle and you put one foot on the pedal and then you push off. Do you think if I'd never ridden a bike, that would be enough for me to understand how to ride a bike? I'd probably fall off, wouldn't I? Because we just know it. It's just something that we just know how to do. Once you've done it once, you go, oh, yeah, and you, you never forget. That's a good example of tacit knowledge. So a lot of these skills are things that we take as self-evident. Of course you'd present yourself well if you were going to work, you think, but maybe not always. So let's move to our first PRS slide then. Which, you're hiring hotel receptionist then. Which two of these skills do you think are the most important? Right. Okay, so these are the numbers of you that have selected these. Emotional resilience and problem solving are your two competencies. That's really interesting, the number skills. I put that one in there because when I started working in shops when I was 14, 15, doing Saturday jobs and even even when I was a retail manager, one of the things we needed was people to be able to do sums to have, be good at maths. And that, that requirement has almost disappeared because you just scan. There's no adding up, no counting out of change. It, it, the till does it all for you. Um, so I'm not surprised that you've not, not rated that one at all. Sense of humour and looking attractive in the middle, but this idea of emotional resilience you've identified as the... Oh, OK. So which of these do you think is probably the least important then for a hotel receptionist? So it's just one, just pick one. So again, you're consistent, if nothing else. Strong numerical skills and a sense of humour. We could actually argue that a sense of humour is part of emotional resilience, depending on your culture, of course. If you heard the expression, you've got to laugh or you'd cry. Yeah, you would do if you worked here. OK, so this is just some, just really to get your ideas on what the changing nature of skills might be. We're perhaps seeing the emergence of new forms of labour. I won't dwell on this in any depth because it was covered admirably by my colleague Melissa Tyler in your previous module last term. Um, and she gave you an introduction to the theory behind um, emotional and aesthetic capitalism. Oops. I don't know what happened to... I should have, had, should have had a note. You should be making notes on your slides that say emotional labour and aesthetic labour. <laughs> 
that may come up in a minute. Um, and here, what's relevant to human resource development, this is an extension of what you learned, the more theoretical um, arguments in OB. Here, what's relevant is whether we can train these skills. So is it possible to teach somebody to look fit? Should workplace look, looking attractive be a subject of workplace training? Yes or no? Let's have a quick straw poll. I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to think about this one. I'm not going to break it down by gender. Let's have a show of hands. Let's go low tech. Who thinks looking attractive should be a subject of workplace training? Yes. Oh, you're going to do half and half, aren't you? I can't count. That's, that looks like a majority. Who thinks no? Yeah, you're in the minority. Ah, that's really interesting. You're all advocates of aesthetic capitalism. Now, who thinks that it is possible to train people? So, okay, maybe it should be, but do you think it's possible to teach people to change the way they, they, their accent and their bodily demeanour is? Yeah, yeah, a few people nodding, yeah, yeah. Whether it's ethical to do so, of course, was the subject of what Melissa did with you last term. Um, but there is an article I put on Moodle, uh, which is from uh, two, well, it's a, it's a research group in the north of England, I think it might be Scotland, actually, where they have spent quite a long time doing research on whether aesthetic skills can be trained and how they can be trained. So if you're interested in reading about this further, for example, if for your case study news story you've chosen something that's about skills development or about appearance or discrimination, lookism. There's some quite a lot of stories around about discrimination on the basis of looks. Um, you might find that article useful and interesting. We're also seeing a rise of white collar work, a demise of the industrial revolution and in factory type work, and that's changing the skills that people need. 25 years ago, nobody would expect anybody to have skills with spreadsheets unless you were going to be an accountant with Excel. Now, basic awareness of Excel is a, a cornerstone of IT literacy. There's an emphasis on qualifications and the codification of knowledge. So where a few years ago you might be able to get a job based on your experience, but without a qualification, that's becoming less and less likely, certainly to middle management and knowledge work. And there's very much an emphasis on learning for life. Rather than just get your qualifications at school, tiny percentage of people went on to university and then you spent the rest of your life doing a job. Now there is an expectation that the employee will take responsibility for continuing to develop those skills as they go through their career. And this links to the notion of career management, which we don't have time to cover on this module, but you will find a chapter on this uh, on your, in your textbook. Right, over to you. I asked you to prepare the case study on, uh, whatever it's, hiding to nothing, on professional accreditation. Um, and you're going to work on that for the next 20 minutes to half an hour. So it wasn't very long. If you didn't find time to read this, then I may as well just give you 20% now, to be fair, because you could have read this on the bus on the way into campus, even if you live in North Towers. So you, uh, you have questions to discuss which are on the back of the case study. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper, and on that sheet of paper, I would like you to write your team name along the top. I want you to fill in some key ideas, and then you're going to swap with a group to give feedback. I am going to collect these in. OK, shh, shut up. Thank you. I'm going to collect these in, so if you could make them legible, and then we'll do the usual. I'll show a few of them to the group. So, is everyone all right with what they're doing? Good. A few people nodding. Thank you. Okay, off you go. We've got half an hour to do this exercise. We'll say till four o'clock, all right? 
um, so that you've got 25 minutes to discussion in your groups. I'll do my best to get around as many of you as I can, maybe not in the middle. I can't reach you in the middle. That's probably why you sit there. Um, but I'll be coming around to, to discuss anything you're not sure about. All right? And I'll come around with some paper. Right, let's pick some of these out. <laughs> I think um, somebody's been taking a leaf out of our book in terms of feedback. What does that mean? Details? So, what does the case study reveal about the real life practice of HRD? that it meets organizational change. I'm not too sure. Yep, employees are, let's have a look at this one. Benefits, let me come out a bit. Okay, so what are the benefits to both organizations and employees? Increased skill flexibility, facilitation of change, more qualified employees, professionalism, Excellent. There's an assumption there that being qualified leads you to be actually being a professional, doesn't it? You certainly would be a member of a profession, but whether that would make you behave more professionally, we'd like to think so, but we're not sure. It's an assumption that we make. Um, benefits for the employee, acquisition of new or updated skills, greater value to the firm and an increase in salary. There's very little intrinsic value to accounting qualifications. I doubt many five or six year olds say, I can't wait to be able to calculate the net present value of the assets of a firm while they're at nursery. Um, so on balance, perhaps the organization gains more in terms of brand reputation. What do we have here? Yeah, so this is a summary of different businesses have different perspectives on how people should go about studying, i.e. time off. If you don't pass the first two sits, you're expected to go elsewhere. Uh, sorry about my manky plaster. Uh, not all costs are incurred by the business. I'm not quite sure what that one means, but it's very much to do with the fact that the costs incurred by the employees are having to work in their spare time, for example. They go to work all day and then they've got to study for their exams to do the job they're already doing. Um, so there's an issue there. Um, the Roche wannabes. <laughs> what have we got here? What's the relationship between the professional body and the organization? Consistency, service, search for relevant topics. Yeah, I mean, there's a positive spin on this, that when you're studying exams, the professional body does, just like we've been seeing the CIPD, um, has uh, a lot of resources that they can throw behind doing research in the field, in that industry. And that means that your employees get access to that, uh, which is a good thing. It also means, I wonder if anybody's, yeah, we've got this one here, mutual relationship, part of the requirement from the organization. But actually, does the, oh, we've got another one here, a win-win relationship of mutual benefit. You're all being very nice to the profession here. Um, have we got anybody that says profession has complete stranglehold on all organizations in the field? Hmm, possibly not. Let's just have a look and see. Um, um, no, that's for number three. This one's just so beautiful, I think I have to show it. They benefit from each other, whoever that was. They benefit from each other. ACCA gain money, BBS employees gain skills and education. It is a trade-off, but the BBS, which is the organization, can't go and get their employees trained by anyone else. They have to have ACCA accreditation. Um, in order to have that market value. Uh, what might happen to those who fail their qualifications? They won't get a job, miss out on potential skills, can look negative, absolutely, yeah. So there's a real 
onus on the individual to take responsibility for their own learning. Uh, let's have another look. What have we got here? Ultimately, the responsible employees are responsible for learning. Well, surely, if the employer wants a skilled workforce for their brand reputation, then it's their responsibility to ensure the staff are appropriately um, equipped with the right skills. And that would, we would assume, be at the very least giving them half a day to do their training. Um, but as anyone who knows these firms will tell you, they want their pound and several pounds of flesh and more for their money. Oh, very good. <laughs> Yep, increases the cost of the firm. So this was, this was what are the drawbacks for the organisation and the employees. What have we got here? <laughs> right, Team Chod. That's a particular piece of slang in English that if you are not familiar with what a Chod is, I suggest you visit the Urban Dictionary and find out. In real life, undertaking qualifications is important. Without it, they would lose their job. That question was particularly looking at how it's difficult to put into practice some of the things we're going to look at in the second half of this session. It's all very easy to say, ah, we engage in a training cycle, we identify training needs, we implement the training, we measure it, we evaluate it. Well, actually, that's really difficult in practice. How do you deal with employees who don't want to be trained? who think they are perfectly competent. And that's a particular issue in organisational change, as a couple of you have already correctly picked out, because you may wish to upskill your workforce, um, and they may not wish to be upskilled. So one of the ways in which BBS did that was to make the first exam sitting free or they would pay for the first exam so they're using that as an incentive do it and do it well now and we'll pay if you fail you resit uh, anonymous this one is uh, what have we got yeah you've got lots of lots of win-wins and lots of fails yeah I'm not surprised that most of you so far all of you have picked out the idea that we, the learner is responsibility, the learner is responsible for being trained because you've all, I think all of you here, I don't think we've got any mature students in this group, um, all of you have been brought up in a culture where it's a learner-centred, the responsibility for learning is increasingly on individuals. Um, it's, it's really something that's changed over the last sort of 20, 30 years. What else have we got? Team name, DB. Who is ultimately responsible for learning in this environment, society? Oh, that would be great, wouldn't it? You say, no, I don't need to do any work because uh, did you not prepare this week? Oh, yeah, society didn't do it for me. They didn't download the case study. Um, it's interesting, though. I'm assuming that that, that answer means culture and that um, that's the, the responsibility, I think. But I'm not sure. I'm thinking on my feet. Um... Oh, there we go. Number one, not much consideration for the graduates. <laughs> Thanks. I was, that's why I was hoping. Give yourself a team name to give us a bit of a lift on a Monday afternoon. Oh, maybe no pun intended with the, with the name of this team. Uh, I don't need any of those. Thank you. Okay, yes, these are slightly more critical. I think we'll just shunt sugar tits off the top. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the benefits of the employee is the proof on paper thing. You know, you've actually got something that you can do it. That's an interesting one. The process of undertaking training whilst you're doing a full-time job also means you can show you can do more than one thing at once. Your degree will demonstrate to your future employers not just that you are absolute experts in business and management studies or management and marketing or whatever it is you're studying, but also that you've got the guts 
and the stamina to stick it out for three years, that you are prepared to invest in your future, that you are pre prepared to go into considerable debt, or mummy and daddy have gone into considerable debt to ensure you have a better chance in the future. So an education and qualification signals those things as well as the subject that you're studying. Thank you very much for that, guys and gals. Um, I will leave these in piles on the end in a minute, and then you can come and get your hard end. Um, just spread them out a bit. You can come and collect your hard end work if you wish to. I'd like to think that we could um, scan them all in and put them up on Moodle, but I think that might take me about 40 years. Right. That's not too bright. Is that all right if I leave that on? Is it a bit light? I know sometimes it can be a bit bright. So, moving swiftly on then, let's look at training and development in a bit more depth. A bit of light relief there. The systematic training cycle, yet another circle. Analyzing training needs, designing training, delivering the training, and evaluate the effectiveness. As we saw in the case study, it's not quite that straightforward. It's this bit here that very rarely actually gets done. Usually, training needs straight to deliver training. Not much thought goes into the design, and not much thought goes into evaluating the effectiveness of the training. So how do you measure whether it's had any difference? Whether those skills gaps have been closed? You can do an analysis of training needs on several levels. Um, these are just the two, the organization and the individual, which is, uh, you know, there is a middle one as well if you want to go and look it up. It's in Sarah Gilmore's book on HRM. Um, let's start with this one here. This is quite common. Big organizations tend to benchmark themselves against competitors. So they look at what other comparable firms are doing and they say, oh, hang on a minute, we're not doing that. Maybe we should. So another word for this is uh, envy, maybe, or jealousy. Um, priority problem analysis, we need something doing. We need to enter social media sphere, for example. We don't have the right skills in our workforce. We either decide to outsource it or we upskill our workforce. Training needs in particular, if, you, if you're wanting to introduce competence standards, then as we looked at competencies last week, if you remember, if you're wanting to raise everybody to this particular level, then you would have to undertake training. You'd have to identify against your competencies rather than requirements of the job. At the individual level, the performance appraisal, which we'll look at next week, has, uh, great, has great importance in training and development needs. So it's the discussion with the manager, the line manager and the employee that identifies either where the employee feels they, they're not happy that they don't have the skills they need or the manager says you're not performing to the standard we require, so you need more training. And if we link this to the talent management approach that we covered briefly last week, it might be that the employee doesn't recognize that they have a development need, that they could be even better. And that's the role of a good line manager, is in coaching the employee to see their potential. So part of that is self-assessment and this idea of continuing professional development. It doesn't stop. Any profession, um, I don't know whether the HR profession need to do CPD, but if you're in a medical profession or a legal profession or the accounting profession, you need to do so many hours per year education um, in order to keep up to date with the latest development. So this is another way that the professional bodies keep their hold over the employees who, or, or the, their members because, funnily enough, continuing professional development courses don't come cheap and it's a requirement of still being a member of the profession that you do them. So going back to training then, I'll just scoop this off for a minute. Which two of these methods are usually associated with training? There is a slight catch to this in that I am particularly asking you about training and not development, all right? 
So e-learning, two, coaching, three, leadership courses, four, mentoring, five, continuing professional development, six, induction. Two of those are usually associated with training and not development. Oh, we're a bit split on this one. Six and one were the correct answers. E-learning, it can be used for development, and we'll look at that in a minute, actually, because as, as technology becomes more sophisticated, you can do an awful lot more via the internet than you could two years ago, five years ago, and certainly ten years ago. Um, but e-learning tends to be... Um, used for training as opposed to development. And we'll, we'll look at the difference in a minute. Uh, and induction, making sure people know where the fire escapes are, the fire policy, where the toilets are, the harassment code, who the CEO is, the sorts of things that you need to know, arguably, when you join an organization. If you think about it as training is, is think of the hypodermic needle, training is inserting information into the employee that the employer needs them to have and developing is encouraging people to inject themselves no i'm not sure that's quite the right metaphor but development is about encouraging potential in the employee that may not be immediately obvious to the employer so uh, number two here coaching is very much a development as opposed to a training um, tool Number three, leadership courses, yeah, the same kind of thing. Four, mentoring, again, that's a very much a, uh, a, a development tool as opposed to training. On-the-job training is different to mentoring. And then induction, uh, number five, continuing professional development is, as its name suggests, development. Oh. Which is not a benefit of e-learning, then? We're going to have a little digression into e-learning before we go back to development. So one of these is not a benefit of e-learning. I'll set that going. There we go. Yes, that is the correct answer, which I haven't actually put in, but that is the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, it is not very good for training soft skills. What do we mean by soft skills? Those kinds of things that are the tacit knowledge, the, um, the personality, the disposition, the customer service, communication skills, negotiation, those sorts of things. Not so good for those types of training. So let's have a look at how e-learning is being used in practice. This is an example of a really interesting platform. The reason the links are not showing so well here is that I hopefully have downloaded the videos while you were doing the case study so that we will actually be able to play them seamlessly from beginning to end. It's a firm called brightwave.co.uk. And it's pretty cool. Oh, except I've actually, hang on. Lifetime Learning Trainers. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Kay. And we're both Lifetime Learning Trainers. And we want to spend a few minutes telling you about Lifetime. All you need is a set of headphones and a PC or laptop. There are over 100 sessions you can access via our website. And they cover business, finance, communication, management, and people skills. Sessions run live three times a day. Every session lasts around 20 minutes. Here's a typical session. The participants are on the right. They may be your colleagues or from different organisations around the world. And there I am at the top. I'm the trainer. 
Our sessions start quickly. We will learn and share in ideas straight away. We keep you constantly involved when using polls like this. Or audio recordings of actors, so you can compare technique. Sometimes we ask you to share ideas using writing tools. And people are always contributing via the chat box. At the end of the session, we ask you to think how you will put the learning into practice. And you can download notes and sources of further information. Don't forget, you can also stay back to ask the trainer specific questions too. At Lifetime, we want to make your learning convenient and enjoyable. We look forward to seeing you on the session soon. Hmm, what do you think about that? <laughs> ooh, it's sort of, ooh. How would you like to do your training at work like that? From your desk, eating a sandwich? Who, who thinks they would probably quite like to do that sort of training? Actually, instead of, instead of coming here today, we'd prefer to, to learn in that environment. None of you. Nobody would prefer to learn in that one person, yeah. I teach, I've, I have taught in that kind of environment. It's knackering, I tell you, from a teaching point of view. Much, much harder than doing this. Um, but from a student point of view, I did some research on uh, how my students experienced the... It was nowhere near as technology as sophisticated as that. But we had chat rooms, basically, and we had videos and things. Um, and the novelty factor was quite high. But actually, the, um, the reality was, when it came to the exams, they didn't really feel they'd learnt as much because they were too busy chatting and, and going off topic and so on, although they enjoyed it. It was a quite a mixed bag. But I wonder if in, in an organisational setting that this would work quite well. It's certainly a long way away from the uh, Moodle-type quizzes that you did in BE 400. Do you remember your multiple choice questions in the first year, those of you that were here for the first year? I mean, that's the way we... Everyone's smiling fondly. Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember Patrick and his BE 400 questions. Um, it's, that's the way we tend to think about e-learning training and it's really changing. So um, this is what's known as synchronous, synchronous training, synchronous being at the same time. Oh. So this is much more than this passive delivery of material. It's not like the way we use Moodle. Moodle could be used in ways that are synchronous. I could have chat rooms um, where we would all log on and have online classes. Um, does, it is a slight problem if you can't type very fast because you have to type to talk. And you would think, wouldn't you, that students whose native language is not English would really struggle well, in my experience, I found the complete opposite. The overseas students had a voice because they didn't feel they were sitting in the corner, not being able to speak. Their writing skills were quite good. And we could write in just text speak. Uh, it didn't matter about spelling. It was just about communicating. Uh, and actually, they, they really enjoyed that. So let's have a look at how social media is being used for human resource development. This is a, a five minute video from BP, from the same company. Uh, as I say, I have, I hope, downloaded it so it will play. And this guy is telling us how they use social media at BP. In terms of projects which have made the biggest impact, I think it, it's easier to talk about ones that you must have. Uh, and that's obviously a bit of a mistake, really, because you should always think about what's the end of its impact. Um, there's, a, there's a few that we're working on at the moment, um, so I'm not 100% confident about the impact, but they've been designed around having a big impact. So um, I'm optimistic that, that I'll be presenting them as um, some sort of award ceremony in the future. They are a couple of things. Firstly, um, in terms of social media, I've had a few years' worth of experimentation with social media. And I think now, I've got a better sense of what goes wrong and, and, and how to get it right. Um, so we have a, a kind of pilot social media um, experiment, a product manager who's heading us up a guy called Warren Bond. And the idea is to enable the organisation to share best practice and to share learning. So we're generating a lot of kind of short form videos in this, this kind of um, video sharing environment where people can sort of rate different videos and, and see things related to some of the challenges that they face. 
Um, I'm very excited by that. And the initial res response has been, um, has been very positive. So I see that as a kind of strong di direction for us. Um, I think two other projects, perhaps a bit more kind of conventional themes. Um, I think diversity and inclusion. Um, we've done a lot of filming. Uh, and we've thought very carefully around how we can make a real difference um, in an area where it's historically very difficult to, to make an impact, to make a difference. Um, and so I'm, I'm particularly pleased with those. What we've done there is we've tried to think differently around diversity and inclusion. Instead of thinking, let's, you know, let's create a course, we've looked at the whole learning process, which is typically something of a workshop. Uh, as a line manager, they make a commitment to the end of that workshop, which often is that they'll go back and talk to their teams. So we thought about what we can do to support them in that process. How can we make that an easier um, or more engaging conversation to have? So we've shot a lot of video drama, which we, um, we hope will support line managers in opening a conversation around diversity and inclusion. Um, and together with the drama and sort of guides and facilitators guides that we want to go out of the depth. The third and final thing is the Discover BP project, where we've taken this, this radically different approach. Um, we've said we're not going to do a, a course, we're going to look at a range of resources which will support the, the needs of our learners, and we know what those needs are because we've talked to them. Um, and they range across this spectrum, I think that's what's interesting about it. They range across the care spectrum from things where we know people don't care, so we want to make them care. So if you're that value, that the organisation has values, then what's the best way of really making people care about those values? All the way to the other end, where they, they care deeply, which will be specific information, which will help them do their job, where we've created this kind of resource format, which we think will, will help people get up to speed very quickly. So there are three exciting projects in very different sort of ways, um, each of which we hope will make a, uh, a big difference. So the priorities that I had a, had a, ahead of me um, probably sort of fall into three categories. Um, at the sort of highest level, we're trying to help support and to drive adoption of BP's values. So they are around safety, so we're working quite closely with the safety community. Um, but there are also some less sort of tangible things we're working um, on the matters such as courage. Um, especially one team. Um, it sounds abstract, but in a large multinational organisation, the work that we do can really help bring people together, um, especially what we're doing in that sort of social media and video sharing space. Um, and Reflect, where we're working, as I mentioned earlier, with sort of DNI content to really make people more aware of inclusivity and what that means on a day-to-day -day basis, to actually be able to see behaviours and, and to model behaviours which will help um, drive more kind of listening culture and an equally speaking up culture. And then finally, excellence. Um, and again, we're working to highlight excellence. Um, I, I have a kind of a honeybee model for learning development, future learning development. I think we are those things. We, we have to be very active in the organisation, identifying the good stuff and bringing it back into a central location so it can be shared. So at the highest level, we're working um, on those values. I think at the kind of middle level, we're working to build capability as well. BP is investing very much in, in, in staff and building up the skills. So we have to work alongside other teams who are delivering you know, face to face training um, to help build capability. Um, and finally, I think business assurance. Um, so to help provide the, the level of business assurance that, that is expected of us. Uh, and to do it in a way which is very you know, construction and uh, very consistent. So again, you can see quite a long way from the click quizzes using social media, in particular video media, um, and allowing people to comment and rate different videos, but letting it, he used the metaphor, the honeybee uh, model of training and development, which uh, there he's talking about hive mentality. He's talking about the fact that nobody really directs the, um, the activity of a hive. The bees just get on with it, but they transmit messages among themselves and they're self-organizing. And that's the kind of metaphor that he's trying to get uh, across there, that by letting things go viral, by putting out these little videos um, of good practice in various different parts of the business, that this stuff will just sort of spread. So it's quite risky. A colleague of mine um, did a study of a merger of telecommunication firms where they allowed, uh, they had a Facebook page where they allowed people to comment on any aspect whatsoever of the merger. And as you can imagine, there were some quite 
damaging, defamatory, rude, stupid comments. Now, as a, an organization, do you allow that? This is supposed to be a forum for free expression. So how far do you censor the, the comments and the rates and all of that kind of stuff? It's, it throws up a whole load of issues that um, certainly traditionally HR departments have not been so, you know, have not had to deal with. Uh, and we're going to look at this in the final lecture of the module about social media and how it's changing the way HR professionals do their jobs but also manage the organisation. But some, some interesting examples there. I'm going to skip through the next couple of slides. Training to development, as I've already said, development is the growth or realisation of a person's ability and potential through the provision of learning and development experiences, whereas training is this deficit model, filling gaps in the capability that the organisation needs to see. 49 billion was spent in the UK on training in 2011. That came from uh, the other video that I didn't show you from these guys here, the National Employer Skills Survey. 49 billion. I was going to get you to think about why uh, companies spend so much money, but we're running short of time and I want to get to the end. Did I give you this slide with all the... No? OK, I'll put this slide up on Moodle. You don't have to copy all this down, don't worry. Um, because we were going to be doing that exercise, I didn't want you to just copy them from the, set, the next slide. So I will put this slide up on Moodle in a minute when I get back to my office. You can see here there's lots of internal drivers for why a firm invests in HRD, changing to roles, changing organisational strategy. This one was identified by one of the groups looking at... Um, why having, why having qualifications, and externally, market factors, new technology, accreditation criteria, all mean that the organisation has to respond by training and uh, by developing their, their employees. This is an interesting slide from um, the most recent learning and talent development survey from the CIPD. Hopefully it's big enough for you to see on your handout. This is uh, right in the grip of the recession. This, this data was gathered um, beginning of 2012, maybe the end of 2011. And apart from the public sector, if we take this out, you can see that all resources available for human resource development stayed the same or increased. That 66% of organisations surveyed didn't cut their training budgets or their development budgets, even though they were under financial pressure. Uh, even the not-for-profit sector 17% of them increased their resources for training and development. So you might think that development is the one thing that gets cut back on when firms are, are, have face an uncertain financial future. But these statistics show that perhaps not. Remember what I said about the CIPD tending to survey its own members who tend to work in larger firms. But here I think we're quite interested in larger firms because smaller firms don't have a budget for training and development usually anyway. Uh, and it tends to be on a much more ad hoc basis. Uh, Headcount just means numbers of people employed in the training team. You can see the public sector is completely different and that's because during this time in the UK the government launched a comprehensive spending review, uh, so-called austerity measures, whereby they reduced the funding available to public sector organisations. There they did cut an awful lot of jobs, as you can see, 60% made people redundant within their training teams. We might say that's short-sighted, perhaps, because if you don't have good training, you end up with skills gaps and so on. So that's just a little bit of information there. I'd just like to finish by showing you, um, yeah, we've just about got time, uh, a video about internships. 20% of UK employers plan to use interns in the summer of 2010. That was the latest figures I could find. That's an awful lot. An internship comes from America, but the idea of an internship, I'm sure you all know, uh, because you've probably been either undertaking them or looking for internships. And those are usually placements within an organization where you are not paid the same rate as the other people you're doing the job with. And the idea is that you 
use it to gain experience and to gain a notch on your CV, particularly with, an, with a, a, a good prestigious organization. The more prestigious the organization, the less they need to pay. So this has come under a lot of controversy. 37% uh, of, of organizations who use interns pay less than the national minimum wage. That is now beginning to be ruled as unlawful by employment tribunals. But if you remember back to your employment law courses, an employment tribunal does not make the law. It's not like another court of law in the, in the land which actually makes common law. Employment tribunals just make decisions on cases. And so it's not illegal yet for uh, an organization to pay nothing to an intern if they want to. It's not very good practice. Um, and there's a, a video here which I think you'll find interesting, which is one student's experience of being an intern. students and graduates starting work this summer as an intern in the hope of winning a job. He graduated two years ago, but has been unable to find the job he really wants as a graphic designer back in his hometown of York. I don't know if you're amazing or what I mean. I've been a search in Charleston, uh, I'm on many other places, and I think there was one uh, design job in the whole of Yorkshire. With only his expenses covered, James isn't left with much money for accommodation. Taking up an offer from a friend to use their spare room while they're on holiday means that James can make ends meet the first month of his placement, but after that, he doesn't know how he will cope. If I run out of money, that's it. If I can't get enough money to get somewhere to live, uh, I, I can't be sure that I'll have anywhere to live uh, after this month. Um, so I, I don't know how far we can take it. I don't know if I'll make it to the end of the Trade unions say that the number of unpaid placements have been increasing since the recession. But this has led to an accusation that young people are being exploited. Some interns have even taken companies to employment tribunals and won arguing that they should have been paid at least the minimum wage. Ben Lyons from the campaign group Internal Wear says young people need to know more about their rights. If you're doing similar work to normal employees, you're working set hours, you're doing set tasks, and in return you're expecting to get a reference on this, then it's extremely likely that you are a worker under national minimum wage because there's no definition of legal, or there's no legal definition of intern. And if that's the case, then you have every right to pay the middle wage. And if you can't touch the last you're not being paid back because it's against the law. Yeah. It's estimated around a fifth of graduates in employment six months after leaving university are taken on by employers for whom they previously had work experience. And in such a competitive jobs market, interns like James may be more willing than ever to work that little bit harder and for free in the hope of finding work. And you can listen to podcasts of all Alvin at Forbes Reports there at bt.co.uk slash poorer than their parents. Oh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Sarah Clowns is here, along with Sophie Conaday, who recently graduated from Sussex University. Welcome to you both. Um, Sarah, I'm going to start with you, because we've, for years, interns have worked for free. That's the way to get into the job market. Why is this coming up now? I think it's interesting thing. I, I worked for free years ago. Oh, I did a great degree in biology, wanted to go into arts administration, and my knowledge of food supplies was a very good use. Um, I think the reason that there's a fuss about it now is that A, um, graduates are finding it really hard to get jobs. And secondly, I've, so what the unions are saying is that there's a change in the kind of companies that are looking for interns now, whereas it was traditionally the media and, and charities and politics that were the big use of interns. Well, now they say there are lots of other companies that have never considered them before who they suspect are just looking at for free or very cheap labour. And I looked at the government's intern website yesterday where you can look at internships. And there were quite a few job, quite a few internships that were, you know, for, you know there's no wage paid at all, no minimum wage. And, you know, it looked like a proper job to me sometimes. So, since you graduated, have you felt exploited as an intern? Um, I've had a mixed experience with my internships. On some occasions, Yes, I do think I have been. Um, 
Um, well, I've been given tasks um, like picking up laundry, um, taking dogs for a walk for my editor. Most of the job that, you know, I'm not really learning anything there by doing those tasks. But then again, I have learned a lot from other internships. Um, what worries me is those situations where they do look like genuine placements for a genuine paid role. Um, and now you're doing that for free. That's what the worrying situation is. How, when you've done these various um, placements, how did you learn to distinguish? Just for anyone who's watching, you think, okay, I, I need to get experience, but I need to get a good experience. How, how did you learn to distinguish what was good and what was bad? Um, I think it just comes, unfortunately, from doing them. Um, I think if you go to um, you know, a website like Volcano.com where they, where they list the, the applications properly, you can see how much you'll be paid and what you're expected to do on the internship. If they're just work <coughs> placements um, with nothing laid out beforehand, then perhaps you'll get more chance of getting sort of messed over that. Yeah. So I wonder whether you said that the words we use have changed what we expect out of this, because when we call it work experience, people thought it was just that, work experience going in for free, but now it's called intern, we kind of expect uh, some kind of remuneration. Well, I think what those who are concerned about people being supposed to say is that you know, companies are really advertising these in the way they would advertise jobs. And that, I mean, the law is actually very clear that you should be paid the minimum wage if you are a worker. And you know, that means you should have a contract, but it doesn't mean a written contract. So basically, if you've got regular hours and you're expected to be there from 9 to 5 and you're doing, you're doing set tasks and kind of it's a problem and you don't do them, you should be paid the minimum wage, and as I said in the report, people have gone to tribunal. Mm. I think the problem is, though, that for many graduates in the university, they haven't got a sense of the workplace, they don't have an insight, and they don't have contacts, and it's contacts, I think, are the most valuable thing from doing these internships or unpaid work, rather than necessarily actually doing the job, it's actually making contacts with the working world. And I'll say, actually, that making the tea always seems like such a meaningful task, but that's when you get to meet all the people in the office and learn office politics and how to react. Did you ever get a good job or a job offer from an internship? Um, I've had freelance work from the contacts that I've made in internships, certainly. But I think there is a habit in these interns at internships where they suggest there will be a job at the end of, say, a three-month period. And that's very common. A lot of interns I've spoken to have been promised some sort of paid work at the end of it. And, you know, more often than not, they don't materialise. So there is a culture of promising you know, if you work another six months, you may get permanent employment, and then it doesn't actually come. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed. So you just need to be careful when you're applying. That's great. Just going to check it out a bit before you actually go there. Anyway, Sophie, Sarah, thank you very much. How depressing is that? Um, when we think about who, going back to uh, the case study, who actually benefits Who's responsible for the learning? We could perhaps see the answer to that question more clearly when we look at something like an unpaid internship. The employee is responsible for their learning, but who's getting the benefits here? Overwhelmingly the employer. They get probably a brilliant, bright, keen, enthusiastic graduate like everybody in this room for free. So I just wanted you to be aware that when you're looking for internships, just, just bear that in mind. You know, they're lucky that you are willing to work for less money to gain experience or for free. Um, but it's as an HR tool, if we take off our, our critical hat and we stand on the HR side of the fence, what a bloody brilliant invention that is. You can give them a real trial on the job, you can charge it you can basically they cost next to nothing they're going to be really committed because they're desperate for this job that you're actually not going to give them you know we're going to look at whether hr is ethical in a few weeks time and i think it's a good example of that um, but it, as an hrm recruitment selection and development tool you know it's pretty good this is just the story of the of the woman who was successful uh, in bringing her case in 2009 um, just to give you a bit of information there. Okay, so in summary then, skills are changing. A skilled workforce is not just an organizational issue. We're seeing a shift from training to development, but we've got to ask who really gains from development. 
new forms of human resource development techniques. We've looked at e-learning and we've looked at internships. There's lots to apply here to any stories on skills that you find in the news for your assignment. So hopefully I've given you enough to go on. Thank you all very much and I will see you next week.